Hello, hello, welcome back. I'm Teresa, your host, and together we'll be taking a trip to Africa to learn about the top 10 historical events in Africa that you never were taught in school. Let's go. Number 10, design capital of the world. This is more recent history for you, as in 2014, Cape Town became not only South Africa, but Africa itself, first ever city to be designated the renowned title of world design capital. When a bid for the WDC designation, South African officials recognized that they faced many challenges that could benefit from design as a problem solving tool. Through its theme, Live Design, Transform Lives, they sought to establish a legacy that would enable the city to make better, smarter decisions to ultimately improve the everyday lives of its citizens. These included examples of public and private collaborations and innovations, urban planning and renewal, sustainable solutions for housing, agriculture, energy and climate change, public sector responses to urbanization, and community building with social cohesion within struggling cities. This designation increases tourism and funding, and also boosts advertisement for travel in other countries. By using design as a tool for citizen engagement in 40 co-designed workshops covering 80 of the 111 wards of Cape Town, they took design inspiration for public art, park spaces, and local business districts. A total of 2,051 people participated in the workshops, meaning African citizens got to be hands-on with planning and see the execution of their community work together. We should take some inspiration from that here in North America. If the lion doesn't get you, they definitely will. Number nine is the black mambas. Animal poaching is a huge issue in Africa as wealthy tourists ignore animal protection laws and their own safety and troop forward with heads full of blatant ignorance to kill endangered species such as rhinos, elephants, and more. Anti-poaching expeditions aren't new as a result. These groups go out and find poachers who are both locals and tourists alike to arrest and charge them before they do any harm. So meet the Black Mamba. Rough and tough, what makes them unique is they are an all women's ranger unit protecting the Balul Nature Reserve in South Africa. While park visitors are relaxing at Balul's many tourist attractions, the Mambas are working hard in the background. They collect bush meat snares, monitor camera traps, and keep watch for evidence of illegal activities such as poisoning or bush meat kitchens. Alongside their patrols, the Mambas run Bush Baby Environmental Education Program, which offers local school children weekly lessons about wildlife and conservation. It's all part of their plan to make poaching a thing of the past through education, inspiration, and food security. Before the Black Mambas were founded in 2013, poachers would enter the reserve regularly. We've reduced that by 89% and we We've received awards from conservation organizations in South Africa, the USA, and China, says Sergeant Kud Moholongo. Number eight is the creation of Kaun City. This ancient Egyptian city built in 1895 BC is said to be the world's first ever planned city, rather than a group of inhabitants settling down and more joining the habitation or being birthed into it over time, which is usually the cause of unplanned expansion. No, Kaun City was different. Rectangular and walled, the city was divided into two parts. One part housed the wealthy inhabitants, such as scribes, officials, and foremen. The other part housed ordinary civilians, necessary for the economy. The streets of the western section in particular were straight, laid out on a grid, and crossed each other at right angles. A stone gutter over a half meter wide ran down the center of every street, as functional sewers and restrooms, as you'll learn, were mastered by ancient African people. This is a unique thing to have claim over. Not the, not the toilets, but the planned city thing. Houses were built of mud brick and had beamed flat mud roofs, open cords and porticos, and also they had the earliest examples of supporting wooden columns. But the city was actually only a temporary site for the workers building the Alahun Pyramid to live in. So it was abandoned after the pyramids were finished. Another grand creation is number seven, the Great Wall of Benin. That fun little quip is actually in regards to the size of this Nigerian medieval kingdom. It's said to be built on scale comparable to the Great Wall of China, but there wasn't one giant wall at all. There was hundreds of walls, a vast system of defense totaling 10,000 miles in all, considered the largest earthworks in the world carried out prior to the mechanical era. Benin City's planning and design are miraculous too, according to the careful rules of fractal design which uses symmetry, proportionality, and repetition. The city and its surrounding villages were laid out to form perfect fractals. That was also repeated in the rooms of each house, the house itself, and the cluster of houses in the village in mathematically predictable patterns. Large streets comprised a sprawling series of structures for living, stores, and public buildings interconnected by innumerable doors and passageways, all which were richly decorated with the art that made Benin famous. In the early foreign explorers written descriptions of Benin City, it portrayed it as a place free of crime and hunger, with large streets and houses kept clean, a city filled with courteous, honest people and run by a centralized and highly sophisticated bureaucracy. Just remember that in the same year, an English professor described London, England as thievery, sex work, murder, bribery, and a thriving black market made by the medieval city ripe for exploitation. 
But man, did those Brits love to call everyone else primitive. Since we're discussing how revolutionary African cities are, number six is advanced construction for historic times, at least in comparison to the European world. There are endless descriptions from visitors to some of these cities that spin tales of intense grandeur that seem almost impossible given the tools and slow progression of society at the time. But Africa wasn't slow, and that's what people don't seem to know. So let's run through some real life documented examples. Chinese records of the 15th century AD note that Mogadishu had houses of four or five stories high. A comment verified by archaeologists, houses fully intact and still inhabitable today have been found in Old Dijin in Mali, several stories high, but also with underground rooms, staircases, and connecting halls. Sudan in the 9th century AD also had multi-level houses, also differing in spatial layouts and functioning water systems, and water heating systems for the kitchen and bathroom. A ruined mosque in the Kenyan city Gedi was found to have a water purifying system made of limestone so as to recycle and filter their water. Multiple palaces found such as Husuni Kabwa and Mount Fiora have been found to have chandeliers, murals, swimming pools, and real glass windows. Fueled by oils, many of these cities also had street lighting alongside their citywide sewer and water systems. Had colonialists not blindly rampaged in like children, maybe they could have learned something that improved their societies and made them progress quicker, instead of just decimating others and everything being lost to time. Number 5 is Gold and Bling Modern estimation says that South African gold mining was that of an epic scale. An estimated amount of gold ore mined from the entire region by the ancients exceeds 43 million tons. The ore yielded nearly 700 tons of pure gold which today would be valued over 7.5 billion dollars. Meanwhile in West African gold mining it's estimated 1500 to 3500 tons worth more than 30 billion in today's market. So it comes as no surprise the African population used it like crazy. In 1324 AD Malalian ruler Mansa Musa brought so much money with him to Egypt his visit resulted in the collapse of gold prices and it took 12 years for their economy to bounce back. A 16th century traveler visited Central African civilization of Kanam Barno and commented that the emperor's cavalry had golden stirrups, spurs, bits and buckles. Even the ruler's dogs had chains of the finest gold. In 1067 AD the emperor of Ghana was said to have an almost identical setup including a golden temple room. A Portuguese chronicler of 1600 AD Africa described the country's peoples as finely clad in many rich garments of gold, silk and cotton. And the women with much gold and silver chains and bracelets which they wear on their legs, stomachs and arms and many jeweled earrings in their ears. Even the famous palace of Mount Fura is known for having gold chandeliers, outlines furniture, rafters, beams, decor pieces and cutlery also made of gold. It's easy to say that gold has a high cultural significance to the people of Africa's past and present so always be conscious, do your research and don't appropriate. Let's talk the Lost Knox, number 4 on the countdown, ah tongue twister. The Knox are one of the most mysterious of ancient African civilizations. Located in what's now central Nigeria, the first evidence of their existence was actually an accidental discovery during a mining operation. The initial discovery kind of fell flat for some reason, but when a further trove of artifacts was unburied in 1928, archaeologists finally came rolling in. All we knew was that A, they were super ancient and B, they made a ton of terracotta heads. Like a lot. They're currently using these terracotta heads to date the time of the Knox existence, which is constantly being revised to be older and older and older. Currently, the assumption is the Knox culture may have been early 1500 BCE, being one of the earliest, if not the earliest, civilization in sub Sahara Africa. Wow. Knox developed smelting techniques which gave them iron tools much earlier than their neighbors that date back to 500 BCE. This technology leap meant that the Knox skipped over the Bronze Age entirely, going from stone to iron. Incredible. Knock artifacts are spread over 50,000 square kilometers, inspiring archaeologists to believe in a potential mass knock city sitting somewhere beneath or around, waiting to be discovered. Unfortunately, the reason we haven't yet is Knox used mud and wood to build their empire, something that the climactic conditions of Nigeria easily broke down over hundreds of years. Number three showcases the power and resilience of African women, the Igbo women's uprise. The colonists' first mistake was in taking power of Africa, their second was in undermining it. The Igbo history, it's 
remembered as the Women's War, a massive revolt against the policies imposed by colonial British controlling Nigeria. In 1914, colonial governors implemented an indirect control and ruling system. Under his plan, they ruled locals using warrant chiefs who were traditionally the pre-existing Igbo chiefs. It became downright oppressive. Property was being stolen, draconian regulations implemented, go look up what I mean, and the imprisonment of those who spoke out against it. It was hard not to be mad at the warrant chiefs, but they were just the messenger. So what blew it out of the water was the colonialist imposed a special tax on the Igbo market women, people responsible for supplying food to the growing urban populations in varying Nigerian cities. Obviously, the population feared the taxes would drive many of the market women out of business and seriously disrupt the supply of food and non-perishable goods available to the populace. So November 1929, thousands of Igbo women congregate and protest warrant chief theft and tax at administration centers. They used a fun tradition dubbed sitting on a man, which is to censor men. They did this via all night song and dance ridicules. These icons also attacked colonial stores and banks, broke into prisons to release prisoners, and attacked the colonial monuments by burning them down. This two month siege had a reported 25 thousand Igbo women participants and in the end the Igbo women's action forced colonial authorities to drop their plans to impose attacks on the market women and curb the power of warrant chiefs. The women's uprising is seen as the first major challenge to British authority in Nigeria and West Africa during the colonial period and became a historical example of feminism and anti-colonial protest. Number two is another story of incredible perseverance, the little George. You're quick to be taught in school about all the ships that made it to America with captured Africans and all the ones that sank with them. How about a story where the colonists were tossed overboard instead. Well, it happened once with the Little George in June 1730. This little known revolt was one of the most successful on sea uprisings of captured Africans in high sea history. It was five days into the voyage from the coast of Guinea to what's now Rhode Island, USA. There was a documented 96 captured people aboard and held below in the poor ventilation, chained and piled amongst each other. Several of the captured men and women below began working tirelessly to free their wrists of shackles, unaccepting of this reality, so that on June 6, at 4 a.m., the captives were able to burst through the bulkhead of the ship. Unarmed, exhausted, dehydrated, it must have been adrenaline and the ancestors who aided them as they decimated the three watchmen who tried to alert the other crew. Using a homemade contraption of gunpowder and a glass bottle, other captives threatened to ignite it, something the rest of the crew would realize would blow a hole big enough to sink the ship. So the crew all surrendered. They doubted the Africans would be able, with no sailing or navigation experience, to use the ship and get back home and ultimately give up to them. No! These guys knew celestial mapping. They turned the ship around and sailed it back to the African continent, surviving off of the rations meant for the crew. It was their turn to starve anyway. After a few days, the little George reached the mouth of Sierra Leone River, where the Africans and British crew abandoned the ship, leaving the Captain George Scott aboard. Number one is Origin of Man. You're hearing it here first, maybe, but the human race is of African origin. Now, it's important to divide the line. I am not referring to Neanderthals, but rather the subset of human that follow and is what we are now. Referred to as Homo sapiens sapien, remains found in Omo, Ethiopia are the oldest in the world, dating back to 230 plus thousand years old, and no older ones have yet to be found. They're titled Omo 1. The remains, they were originally thought to be from a later time period, using endless DNA testing and also the layering of volcanic ash, as well as debris over the remains through different periods, to help us determine a much older age just last year in 2022. A New York Times article published in March of 1979 documented this discovery on the front page when it first happened, under the title, Nubian Monarchy Called the Oldest. As curious readers leafed through, they were able to learn that evidence of the oldest recognizable monarchy in human history, preceding the rise of the earliest Egyptian kings by several generations, has been discovered in artifacts from ancient Nubia. This area is now the territory of northern Sudan and southern modern day Egypt. This isn't a new theory or fact, however, as it's been long thought that we began in a single east or south. South African region, which eventually spread into Asia and then into Europe. But it is one left out of a lot of textbooks in school. All right, all right, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Please be sure to like and subscribe if you'd like to see more from us, and comment down below what you wish you'd learn sooner.